Welcome to our show tonight, Polygamy, What Love Is This? Uh, my name is Doris Hansen. I'm uh, your host for the program, and it's my privilege to be the host of this show. I was born and raised in the Kingston Polygamy Group and was taught from a very young age that polygamy was the only way to please God and the only way to get to heaven and that to reject polygamy and even to reject the Kingston Polygamy Group was to choose hell and have the eternal status as being a son of perdition. Well, to make a very long story very short, I found out differently, and so we do this show to let polygamists know that God has decreed a much better way than polygamy for salvation. This is a live uh, telephone call-in program, and we are broadcasting from Salt Lake City, Utah. We do invite your telephone calls. Our number is 801-973-TV20, 801-973-8820. And if you have questions and comments that you would like to make off the air, you can email them to us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com. And you can watch all of our previous programs on the internet at our website, whatloveisthis.tv. All, all the shows are there on streaming video. And if you want to access the top questions that have been asked on the show, you can find them out at whatloveisthis.tv slash answers. And you can find the questions as well as the answers at that website. We do have a support group, a discussion group. We meet once a month. Um, our next group meeting is next Monday evening, May 17th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, this support group is for everyone or anyone who is interested in talking to people who have been there or maybe you're still there. If your life has been touched by polygamy in any way, you are invited to come to our group. You can call tonight, leave your contact information, and we can get back to you and give you the details. Or you can email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com and we'll give you the details. You can also log on to our website, shieldandrefuge.org, to find out more about us and also to find out how you can receive our resources. We have a DVD and a book. Both of them are about polygamy, biblical polygamy. And um, if you've been uh, in the Mormon church or in a polygamy group and you would like these, we will send them to you free if you contact us on the internet. Uh, if you want to get information, if you're in a polygamy group and you would like to know how we can help you, we would love to talk to you. We have a toll-free number. It's 877-425-9993. You can give us a call. We can talk about your situation. We can help you get out. We can help you stay out. And we'll help you after you get out as well. So give us a call on our toll-free number and everything will be held in confidentiality. <clears throat> Several months ago, we received an email from a lady who had been in the LDS church for most of her life, and she had discovered that there were many hidden facts of Mormon history that she didn't know. And a lot of it was some disturbing information that she had discovered about polygamy as well. Uh, wisely, after discovering the deceit of the Mormon church, she and her family ended up leaving the Mormon belief system, and then they discovered that there was a huge void left in their lives after they left the church. In part, uh, she wrote an email, and in part, this is what she said. She said, I left Mormonism after many, many years. I was a faithful Mormon, faithful in my temple work, attended church every Sunday, paid my tithe faithfully. My husband was also a member. He taught seminary and was in the bishopric several times. Since I left, I've devoured LDS history. I can't believe how ignorant we were, how duped we were. I'm getting to know the God of the Bible through much study and the support of our new Christian congregation, but I still have so much to learn. Please help me figure this out. Well, this email is easily a prime example for hundreds, perhaps even thousands of people who leave the Mormon fundamentalist or any Mormon-based religion, and they don't know where to turn for safe advice and safe help. And the key word here is safe. Leaving a belief system that you have known all your life can be devastating, and it can be very traumatic. For those of you who have done that, you can certainly understand. 
um, how that's the case. And many people become totally disillusioned. And uh, perhaps they will turn agnostic at best, or maybe they will turn atheist or even God-haters at worst. And yet there are many people who, after leaving uh, and finding out that, that, that it was wrong and a counterfeit religion, uh, that they still find that they want to grow spiritually, they want to have that spiritual aspect in their life, but they have a dreadful fear of searching out a church that they don't know and understand. They fear being deceived all over again. And after having been lied to all their lives, they wonder who, can, who what can we trust? Uh, or, or even can we ever trust again. Tonight we want to speak to those who are uh, thinking of leaving the Mormon funda fundamentalism or even any Mormon-based religion. Perhaps you've already left and you haven't given up believing in God, but you're absolutely apprehensive, even fearful of how to go about finding that safe place to learn and grow spiritually. And so to lead us in our discussion tonight is our guest, who has been on this show before, and he's been in this very situation. He is the pastor of Wasatch Church in Roy, Utah. He was a previous Mormon, and he did discover that uh, it wasn't biblical, like biblical Christianity at all. He discovered the truth, and then he cast off the reverence that, that he had for Joseph Smith and embraced the only true God, which is the God of biblical Christianity. I'd like to welcome and thank you again for coming tonight, Ross Anderson. Thank you. Glad to, ha glad to be here. It, it's such a pleasure to have you here, and, and we got some good, good stuff to talk about. We do. We are looking forward to tonight. it. How many years ago did you leave the Mormon religion? It was uh, 1973, so it's been quite a while. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. Was it a very difficult exiting process for you? It wasn't as hard as it might have been. Uh, I didn't live in Utah at the time. We lived in California. And so the culture of Mormonism is a little different down there, mm -hmm. being uh, in a minority rather than in the majority. And so some of the social pressure and some of the, um, you know, community and family pressure didn't exist the way it might in, in Utah. So the it the shunning probably wasn't as, as harsh as it would have been. <clears throat> no, it, wouldn't, it wasn't. My parents were very gracious. They're, they're active. They were active LDS till, till the day of their death. And they were uh, very gracious. Mm -hmm. They figured I was going through a phase. Mm -hmm. It was when I decided to go to a theological seminary, graduate school, to prepare for ministry that um, I really, that's when they really just realized that it wasn't that just it was a phase, for real. it was for real, it was, <laughs> it was life changing. A permanent thing. <laughs> well, being a pastor in this culture and experiencing that dramatic change that happens when you actually change religions, um, it's rendered you certainly more sensitive to mm -hmm. the culture around us and the needs of those around who do um, come to that point. And so in that, uh, because of that sensitivity, um, and because you're a pastor, you've mm -hmm. written this workbook, and it's entitled uh, Jesus Without Joseph. Now, there should be a graphic come on the screen there. And you've written this workbook so that mm -hmm. uh, you could help people work through the very um, exiting process that we're talking about in that transition. Would you explain, actually, it's a very appropriate title, you know, and I, I hope it's not offensive to anyone, but uh, it's so appropriate and self-explanatory. But would you explain the purpose that, that moved you to write this book and how effective it's been in the church that you're working in? Yeah, you know, uh, the fact is a lot of people exit from Mormonism. Um, the, there was a Pew, the Pew Forum did a big survey of the all of American life last summer, and they particularly focused on Mormonism as part of that, and they found that 30% of those who are raised LDS leave the LDS faith, hmm. and about half of them end up in another faith group, and half of them end up nowhere. So the fact is people are leaving Mormonism. 30% is a pretty big percentage. <clears throat> it is. It's quite a lot of people, and so around here there's going to be, you know, in the, in the homeland here in Utah, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people who have left Mormonism and, and, and many of them are looking for and finding new spiritual homes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to, they need help yes. to find their way. It's so different, the, the culture. It's not just a belief system, you know, it's a culture, right. it's a whole way of life, it's a whole identity. And so, um, it's one thing to, to come to grips with, with new beliefs, but then another layer in the transition is come into grips with a whole different way of doing church or experiencing spiritual life or uh, really what does it mean? And that's the, the book is called Following Christ.
Christ after leaving Mormonism? Mm -hmm. How can I continue to follow Christ or find new ways, biblical ways of following Christ when there's a whole new culture to learn, a whole mm -hmm. new set of expectations and norms and, uh, that are different? And you just feel, and we're going to get into all of those, all of those aspects of it. Uh, how can a viewer uh, get a hold of this book, and how much does it cost? Where they, can they get it? And yeah, there's only one cost? place to get it. <laughs> That's from me. <laughs> it's self-published. And um, my website is uh, called utahadvance.org, all one word, utahadvance.org. And there's a place, uh, there's a there's an online store where they could oh, okay. um, order the book. Great. And I would, I'll ship it to them. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. And, and how much? Seven dollars. Seven dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's certainly doable. Um, so we're, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the book tonight and study different aspects mm -hmm. and, and apply them. And by the way, this is applicable to <clears throat> anybody who was raised or has been in any religion that's Mormon-based. It can be Mormon fundamentalism. It can be Mormonism mm -hmm. itself. There are a lot of, of splinter groups out there that split off from the mainline mm -hmm. Mormon church, and they're all Mormon-based. And so this applies to any and all of them. First of all, when someone leaves a lifetime religion, it doesn't matter whether you're 18, years old or 80 years old, there's a transition. Mm -hmm. And some people can go through it more traumatically than others. Mm -hmm. Others just seem to smooth right into it. But some go through quite um, um, a difficult problem. And the first chapter in this book is called Culture Shock. <laughs> <laughs> and that's basically uh, what it is. It is a good label for the first section. And I would like to read um, off the first page. It's on page one from a, a woman who responded to some of your questions. Mm -hmm. And she had been in the Mormon religion. She said, when I re realized that I was no longer a Mormon, I felt my identity had completely fallen apart. I knew that I was on the path that God wanted me to be on spiritually, but what did it mean to be me? I felt shaky and unsure about everything. It was like looking at a city after an earthquake. I was sitting in the middle of the rubble trying to figure out how to put me back together. It was a scary and insecure time for me. How do I start to feel at home? in a new church. And so in, um, in this first section, there's, there's a vulnerability, a disorientation, mm -hmm. there's an unfamiliar environment. How do you bridge mm -hmm. the gap? What, what is your uh, working on that? It's, it's really challenging because I use the analogy of an immigrant, a person who's left their homeland and they're not going back, but they have a new world to, to live in. And so if you're an immigrant in another country, you know, you don't know all the customs. You don't know how things work, you know. Uh, we've traveled around some, my wife and I, and there's certain things you just do and don't do in different places, and mm -hmm. you don't know all that. Yeah. And it can be oppressive after a while, you know, and to figure it out. And so I felt like, um, you know, people coming out of any LDS group, but any, any tight-knit religious group um, can experience some of the different issues related to culture shock. And it's every, um, every group has a culture, every church, every... Every human group has different ways that they mm -hmm, do things. The way they do things. And so that can be, uh, that could be really daunting. And the first thing I, I want to get at in, in the study guide is simply that how important the church is in God's plan. Mm -hmm. Not the church with a capital C, but the, the people the of local God. The church. Yeah, uh -huh. the people of Christ gathered locally in a congregation. How important that is in God's plan so that a person coming out of maybe a negative experience in a, in a church setting... Um, they don't feel like it's like throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. They're willing yeah, to try again. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one thing that you mentioned in here is um, be patient. Uh, don't react judgmentally. Try to understand mm -hmm. before, you, before you get upset or, or, or distressed and leave, give it a chance. Mm -hmm. Give it yeah. a chance. They, um, they don't need to go it alone. That's, God that's has a, a plan that's for a them. Huge they know, it's just knowing that God has a plan, that He's at work, that He's going to see you through. You can take a little bit of risk, even though it's hard, mm -hmm. and know that you know, the, the new church environment can be daunting and threatening because you just don't know, who do I talk to? Sometimes people fear um, that if they discover that I used to be LDS, they'll you know, judge me or, or ostracize me in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of fears mm -hmm. that go into that. A fear of the unknown, fear of what people don't understand. Yeah. And that can yeah. go both ways, Yeah, not just the, the one-sided. And part of it's not just the unknown, but part of it is in, in some of these groups, you know, there's, there's been, um, people have been taught that other churches are, are, are 
evil or that, yeah. they're, they're, that there's something wrong. It would be dangerous spiritually to walk in through the doors of another church. So you have to overcome sort of that inherent training mm -hmm. or, or uh, you, what would you call it, um, uh, indoctrination mm -hmm. about other churches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and some of the churches have been... <clears throat> have been um, um, illustrated to them to be the church of the devil right. or, or something mm -hmm. like that, demonized, so to speak. On page um, five, you have um, a very good suggestion, and I would heartily suggest this for anyone who is uh, being uh, cultured into a Christian church. Uh, you said, as, as you have questions about the customs and practices of the church that you attend, write them down. And when you have a list of several items, make an appointment with your pastor to ask your questions. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. And this is actually a very, very good suggestion. Um, write down your questions. Don't be afraid to ask if, if, you, if the pastor's really, really busy or something and then you're a woman, go, you go to the woman's minister and talk to her or a deacon or somebody in the church. But ask your questions. There certainly isn't anything mm -hmm. wrong with asking questions. Right. And it's okay. And th those questions will usually be welcomed. And, you know, <clears throat> living in Utah, I think most of our pastors and churches have enough experience dealing with the local religious culture yeah. that they understand, you know, what those questions will be and, and, and have answers for those things. And, the, and that will also give the pastor an idea that he's supposed to be the shepherd of the people. Mm -hmm. He'll get him an idea of where this person is at. That's really helpful. Uh, and a better, a better knowledge of that person. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's go to section two, um, and that is entitled Dealing with Loss. And I would like to read just a little bit from uh, his first page on that. Um, the person wrote, How do I cope? with the loss of many things that defined me and were dear to me in their previous religion. Mm -hmm. They've lost something. Now this, I, I found this, the, the whole book is just awesome, Thank Ross. It, it is so good. And I just heartily agree, yes. anybody, if you are going through any of this, I urge you to get this. But loss, this is a big mm -hmm. one. They've lost their heritage, mm -hmm. uh, their purpose, yep. uh, their future. They think they've lost so much. And yet there's so much hope that is really there. It's a negative and a big positive as well. Yeah, it is. And realistically, anyone who comes to faith in Christ is going to suffer loss mm -hmm. because we, we, we have to, you know, leave behind the old life, whatever that was. Maybe I came to Christ, you know, out of a secular life or maybe out of a life of, of blatant sin or maybe out of a religious culture or whatever it was, there's going to be some loss. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the New Testament is full of promises Christ himself makes promises that whatever we lose, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. And you even have some scriptures in Philippians that you wanted to mm -hmm. use how Paul approached that idea. Yeah, I think that passage in Philippians chapter uh, 3 is really helpful because Paul says, whatever, I've, whatever was gained to me before, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, whatever was important to me before, um, he says, I count it lost for Christ. Doubtless, he says, um, whatever it is, whatever it was, he, and he talked earlier about his heritage, his uh, culture, his achievements, everything that you know, he had done in his religious life, and he'd lost that for following Christ, but he said, that's okay because of the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. Mm -hmm. Not religion, but, but knowing Jesus. That's, a, that's better than anything. And you know, for, for us that have done that, we can certainly, uh, certainly valid, uh, say that as well. And, and he actually, he called it rubbish. He yeah. called it garbage. Yeah. Everything that he had, and he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. Mm -hmm. he, had, he was the top, the cream of the crop. He crown. had a wonderful religious heritage, but it didn't count Right. compared to following, to knowing, to knowing Jesus. knowing the truth, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, and you mention in this section that we have a new identity. There's a scripture that says, behold, all things are new. Right. And that word behold mm -hmm. is, wow, this, yeah. is, this is great. Listen to this, all things are new. And we are brand new people when we're Christians. We're, our sins are gone. We're, yeah. we're, we're a whole, we've, we've been cleansed. And then you mention we have a new heritage and a new destiny. And I thought I would mention 1 John chapter 5, verse mm -hmm. 13 as far as the new destiny goes mm -hmm. because 
um, in, in 1 John 5, 13, it says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know ye have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And he's saying that you can know you have eternal mm -hmm. life. You, you know your destiny mm -hmm. now. It's not a question mark. Right. You don't have right. to wait. You don't have to work. You don't know if you've always got an, a more work to do. Right. But you know that you have eternal life. And, and then um, we're a royal priesthood. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. The old priesthood's gone. <laughs> yep. You know, the, it, yeah. it's, they, they've resuscitated the old dead priesthood. Right, and tried to make it as if it were alive. Yeah. But we have a royal priesthood. It's something new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely new. And we're, we're, the, we're the children of the King of Kings. Right, so. and we can approach the throne of grace. We don't have to have an intermediary. We don't have to have a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. We can come to Jesus. And there's some excitement mm -hmm. in knowing those things. It's yeah. new. It's different for it's someone. It's different. We have to figure out how it works and what it means in practice. But, but what I wanted to, to do in the booklet is give people hope and encouragement that you know, their life is not over yeah. you know, when they left a group behind and came to faith in Christ. It's only beginning. Right. It's only beginning. And, <clears throat> and then, of course, we're an alien and stranger in the world. And mm -hmm. I think the longer we're here, the more we realize that as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is there anything more you want to say on section two before we move on to section three? No, that's good. That's good. This one is really a great one. Um, I, I think we can all verify that as well. Section three is entitled Learning to Trust. And I would like to read from page 12 on that. Um, your respondent said, I had been badly burned in Mormonism. I really thought Mormonism was God's church. I didn't want this to happen to me again. So who or what can I trust for spiritual matters, mm -hmm. life's direction, if not this so-called one true mm -hmm. church? That is difficult. Who mm -hmm. and what to trust now? Yeah, because I mean, we were taught, I mean, I was taught growing up that there is only one true church, and they're the only ones with the authority to act for God and speak for God. So where else do I go now? You know, and that's why I think many people who come out of an LDS background or some kind of Mormon group end up as atheists mm -hmm. because they've been convinced already growing up that there's no alternative. And Either been, this or nothing. And they've been you know. burned. Yeah. So why, <clears throat> why, um, why go through that again? Why trust anything? It's hard to trust once burned, twice shy. Yeah. Right? It's hard to trust yeah. someone. Uh, yeah, I call it kind of like being gun shy. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing is that they need to learn to, to transfer their trust from an entity mm -hmm. to God. Yeah. Now, and, and yet they don't, I don't think that that when they first come out of, of the, this religious system, they know that they have been trusting a mm -hmm. church mm -hmm. rather than God himself. Mm -hmm. But you had in the, in the booklet, you had scriptures, Jeremiah 17, 5, um, 17, 7, and 17, 9. And mm -hmm. I thought I would bring these scriptures up because yeah, they are good in, in helping you understand that you trust in the Lord, you don't trust in anything else. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 17, 5 sa says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man and makes flesh his arm and whose heart departs from the Lord. Then Jeremiah 17, 7 says, Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. And then verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I saw these verses as verse 5, Don't trust in the arm of flesh. Mm -hmm. Don't trust in man. Mm -hmm. Verse uh, 9, don't trust in, in yourself. yourself. Yeah. But sandwiched in between what you cannot trust mm -hmm. is what you can and who you can trust, and that yeah. is God, trust God. alone. Mm -hmm. and, and when you put your trust in a church or a living prophet or your bishop or your prophet of, of whatever religion mm -hmm. or your doctrine, mm -hmm. you're not trusting God. Yeah, yeah. And, and part of it is you were taught to trust the church because the church represents God. And, and when you leave the church or, or you leave one of these groups, you know, you, you do so partly because you realize that, you know, that person or that group isn't really everything it was cracked up to be. Mm -hmm. And so then you come into an, a new church setting. You're looking for a new spiritual home and, and you're thinking, you know, um, you have expectations because of your experience. 
So you expect maybe that the pastor of that new church is going to have the same kind of attitude toward authority or yeah. th that, that, that your leader did in the, in, the, in the old group. Where, you know, so, but the pastor of that local church is not asking you to trust him. Right. He's not asking you to trust in the church that you're now going to. That's right. just a vehicle for people to follow Christ together in. Right. So it's exactly. a different expectation. How do you recommend uh, and advise people as you go through these issues that they can, can, that they can trust God without a mediator mm -hmm. and that they can trust the Bible, God's Word? Yeah, it, it, really, it really hinges on, on the Bible because that's how we know God has spoken to us. That's where we understand Him. And so in the booklet, I've tried to give some resources that a person could look to to establish the trustworthiness of the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's a, such a key issue. Because mm -hmm. again, we were taught you know, growing up that <clears throat> the Bible is inspired by God only insofar as it's translated correctly. It can't be trusted beyond that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so really building trust in, in Scripture is key, and so that's why I included some resources and some things a person could could look up mm -hmm. to help understand why we trust the Bible. It's right. not just a blind faith. Right, right. And Second Timothy three sixteen, um, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and that word "all" means all. <laughs> it doesn't mean part of it. It doesn't mean as far. You know, when when they say the Bible is translated is the Word of God as far as it's translated correctly, who's the editor? Who gets to be the editor of God's Word to say which is and which isn't? But all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So it's a huge ca challenge, don't you think, for them to overcome the stereotypes. We just briefly mm -hmm. talked about that in the last one. Uh, they come into a Christian church and all of a sudden they're face to face with a pastor that they were taught was the devil's minion. Yeah, yeah. But what I, <clears throat> excuse me, what I find, what I found in talking to many people who have made this journey is that there is somehow, for many of them, there's still this intrinsic trust in the Bible. And that just must be God. That you must know, be. That must be just God you know, drawing someone. And they, and they look at the Bible, they look at the Book of Mormon, and somehow, for many of them on this journey, somehow the Bible ends up being the standard, even though they didn't know all the arguments for why and all the, mm -hmm. you know, it just, they just an intrinsic kind of confidence mm -hmm. in the Bible. And that goes a long, long way. It does. It's very good. I know that <clears throat> when, when I was on my journey, um, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8 was my key verse. Mm -hmm. And once I read that verse, I just, it was just, mm -hmm. that did, it cemented it mm -hmm. in my mind. I could trust everything I read in the mm -hmm. Bible. And all the studies I've done about it since then, my trust is not misplaced. Right. It definitely right. can mm -hmm. trust what the Bible has mm -hmm. to say. Is there anything else that you want to talk about in section three? Well, just the main thing is we want to, we want to help people transfer their trust from a, from a church, from a human institution to trust fully in God, and to learn how to trust in Him directly. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's our main idea. And then the people that are in the church, including the pastor, mm -hmm. are just vehicles, just mm -hmm. other people that's on the same road right. uh, as we're on. Right, exactly. It's a great way to put it. Okay. Uh, we're getting close to where we can start taking some telephone calls. Our telephone number is 801-973-TV20. If you want to start calling in, ask your questions or make your comments if you have a question for Ross uh, about this book um, and what he's put in here. We would love to hear from you. It's 801-973-TV20. Uh, before we go to the telephones, however, we do have a message that we would like for you to see. Are you thinking of leaving your polygamous situation? Are you afraid to leave because you might lose the love of your friends and your family and perhaps even the love of God? Are you afraid you'll become destitute if you do leave? When I ran away from my fundamentalist upbringing and the polygamy environment I was raised in, I had no safe place to go, no place that I knew that I would be safe after I left. And I was so naive, I didn't know that I was exchanging one bad situation for another one. In those days, there were no organizations established to help people who needed to safely exit a polygamous environment. That's why a Shield and Refuge ministry exists today. We're here to help those who want to leave a polygamous situation safely and without fear. 
we do provide you with a safe refuge and you will be shielded from those who would harm you. So if you're thinking of leaving your polygamous situation, give us a call. We're here waiting to hear from you. Our telephone number toll free is 1-877-425-9993. If you have access to the internet, you can locate us at www.shieldandrefuge.org. And you can contact us immediately, day or night. We would love to help you. God has made a promise in Psalm 91.4 that he shall cover you with his feathers and you can take refuge under his wings. And it's his truth that will be your shield. Okay, um, we're back now and we hope you enjoyed our time out. Uh, we do have one off the air question here from Joan in Salt Lake City. She says, where in the Bible is the scripture that says a man should not marry his wife's sister? I am unable to find it. It's Leviticus 18, 18. Um, and if you read the whole chapter of Leviticus, it tells you a lot of um, prohibitions that polygamists generally don't pay any attention to. Okay, our telephone number is 801-973-8820. And we would love to hear from you, your questions and your comments about our subject matter tonight. We have on line one, Jim in West Jordan. Hello, Jim. Hello. Yes, Jim, you're on the air. Possibly to the, the philosophy of polygamy. Where did Joseph get the the uh, view of a pre-existence from in the ancient world? You want to pick up on that one? You know where he got it from? I don't know. <coughs> I've heard that yeah. he's picked it up from some some pagan myths from way back, but I don't know anything exactly. Yeah, I haven't I haven't read or seen anything that really directly deals with you know, sort of cause and effect relationships or, or where, or speculations about where, what sources he may have had access to. Yeah, I, I, yeah I'm studying uh, Mormonism and the uh, occult spiritistic worldview. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Dean Michael Quinn wrote a book on that. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. But I'm, I'm very interested to know where he may have gotten it from. The only place that I'm aware of so far is, uh, is the, the Hindu system, which of course is very old and mm -hmm. believed in a you, you might want to try utlm.org. Um, that's the Lighthouse Ministries website, and they've got everything on there, everything <laughs> that you can think of that has anything to do with Mormonism or Joseph Smith. And maybe you can find some answers on that website. I will do that. Or I maybe, appreciate it. Maybe some of our viewers who are watching the show tonight could call in and answer your question as well. That would be great. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Well, thank you. You're welcome. And good night. Okay, we've got other calls there, but they're not ready to come through yet. So let's go on to section four, new kinds of relationships. On page 18 of your book, mm -hmm. it says, um, the way that the church is structured, it's a mini society. And how mm -hmm. true that goes with polygamy groups as well. Mm -hmm. okay, it's definitely yeah. a mini society. Uh, you're always surrounded by people, like-minded people. The Christian community tends to be more fluid and changing. I think mm -hmm. we could call that freedom. <laughs> Some of that is good, but I think it was harder for me to make connections and feel like it was my church. How can my relationships in this new church ever measure up to the closeness I felt in the ward? Yeah. I mean, part of that is because you you attend the ward you're assigned to, right. and where you live. And so there's a certain... Um, you know, kind of relationship that comes out of that where um, you're going to see those people a lot because you live in their neighborhood or whatever. Uh, whereas in a, in a traditional Christian church, often people, come, people are there voluntarily. Mm -hmm. So they might drive a, a number of miles to come. To, they'll probably drive past a similar church to attend a church of their choice. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it a little more challenging because you might, the, your friends in church might not live near you. Mm -hmm. That's part of it. I, what I've, my experience in the, in the ward is there's a certain kind of closeness, a certain kind of um, shared experience and so forth, but there's a different kind of closeness in the Christian church. The, in the ward, uh, somebody once said, um, they'll bring you a casserole if you're sick, but not if you're doubting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, that's, that's sad. You know, so there's, a, there's an intimacy, a level of intimacy. The closeness is structural, 
but there's a level of intimacy that's that's I think missing mm -hmm. in the ward that is really found in in the Christian church. In the Christian churches, sometimes you just have to find a way to f to get into those relationships. Many churches have small groups or Sunday school classes or things where you have to get beyond just the worship service and start well, connecting with people. And the beauty with that, I think, in the Christian church is your choice. Exactly. You have the freedom to choose. If you go to this church and, and you go there for three or four weeks and, and you, you're you free to go over here and try another mm -hmm. church, mm -hmm. um, maybe just visit that church for a particular mm -hmm. reason and then come back over to this one or whatever, however you want to do it. Plus they have, I believe that we can say um, that most of, of Mormon-based religions have an us versus them attitude. Yeah, good point. Yeah, it's us against mm -hmm. them, us against me and you against the world kind right. of thing, you know. And yeah, and what's definitely. interesting is that most of the Christian churches in the community have a, a, uni a unified attitude. Mm -hmm. We realize that we have different styles maybe and some mm -hmm. different distinctives on secondary matters but that most of the churches are, are united in their basic right. beliefs. Absolutely. And so it's I don't so I can cooperate with those other groups and we'll do things together and mm -hmm. it's not an us and them thing. Right. Right. Yeah. It's and and the freedom there is sometimes it was amazing to me when I mm -hmm. went and started uh, worshiping in a Christian church the freedom that was there. Mm -hmm. Just the the freedom to even say, "Geez, I'm a sinner." <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you didn't yeah. admit that. It, Anywhere else. Okay, yeah. we've got line two, Grace in Salt Lake City. Hello, Grace. Yes. Yes, Grace, you're on the air. Hello, Grace. Yeah, Grace, you need to turn your television down. You need to turn the volume down on your TV. Okay. Okay, what's your question? I, I'm a convert to the church, LDS church. Okay. And for me, I ended up leaving the church when I went through a divorce. And my daughter-in-law got, got all the LDS people against me. And now I'm dying. Now you're what? And back in Salt Lake. I'm 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 dying. You're dying? Yes. Do you need some uh someone to come and talk with you and visit with you? I'm trying to figure out what is right. My whole family thinks that I'm crazy because they just want to believe that when I die that I'll be with Heavenly Father. Grace, um, if you would like to leave your telephone number, uh, we, either I or someone else, can call you off the air and talk to you about this. We'd be very happy to do that if you would want to do that. We would love to call you. Grace, do you want yes, that? Would be wonderful if you could do that. You bet. You leave mm -hmm. the operator, whoever took line two, whatever operator took line two, get Grace's telephone number, and um, and Grace, we, myself, or someone will call you and talk to you about this. Okay, because there there is an answer that's going to give you hope, great, yeah. great hope, mm -hmm. and answer your questions. Hello, are you there, Grace? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn you over to the operator now. You leave her your telephone number and we'll call you. Okay? Okay, Grace? Okay. That would be wonderful. Thank you. You betcha. Mm -hmm. You betcha. We will. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and leave a good time that's best to call, okay? I guess that's okay. Go. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks for calling. Good night. Okay. I. Yeah. Yeah, they got her. Okay, line t three, Tina in West Jordan. Hello, Tina. 
Hi, how are you? Well, uh, we're doing great, thank you. Hi, Tina. Good. Glad to see you guys tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was raised straight LDS my whole life, mm -hmm. and I found the truth. Praise God. But my sister, who's my best friend, still believes wholeheartedly and is married in the temple and living the way that they say she should. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if I should or even try, and if so, how do I try and show her the truth? And I know she's not going to be accepting. I thought about giving her um, Sean McCraney's book, how, uh, Born to Be Born Again Mormon. Mm -hmm. But I, I think she just tossed it in the garbage. So mm -hmm. I just wonder, you know, what I should do. Okay. If I should do anything mm -hmm. at all, or just love her. Well, you should love her definitely. <laughs> Which I do. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and part of that is. Part of, of loving her is sharing with her the truth that you found and the joy you found in Christ and the freedom and grace. Now, that is very tricky because she's obviously very committed. Um, I'd recommend a resource to you. I, I'd recommend that um, you, ha you just keep an ongoing conversation, and when you have an opportunity, you just slip in a little bit. I slip in a little bit, and, and as she gives you opportunity to tell you more, you know, she may give you very slim window, and you take advantage of whatever little window she'll give you, but... But as you, but it, giving her a book or, or something, sometimes that's helpful in certain relationships. But um, you know, she might not read it. So a little bit at a time, a little bit. Ask questions. Um, find out what her heart is. Engage her. Everybody likes to talk about themselves. Everybody likes to share their own ideas. So, so by asking questions and getting her to talk about her thinking, then gives you an opportunity maybe to engage um, response with some of your thinking. And I recommend a resource to help prepare you for that, to know how to talk about that. Okay. Uh, there's a resource called the Mormon Scrapbook that, that's um, really helpful to help Christians know how to talk to their LDS friends, key issues and what to say and, and how to think about those things. Where do I find that? Uh, I think UTLM has that, doesn't they? they? Yeah. You can go to utlm.org <laughs> on the Internet. Okay. And they have a bookstore, and you can probably, I'm pretty sure she's got yeah, it there. Yeah, I'm sure they have it. Okay, and I wanted to answer Jim's question facetiously. Okay. He used a seer stone. Oh! <laughs> we should have guessed that yeah. one. I'm How come sorry, we didn't know? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. We needed to smile here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you for your call. Have a good night. All right, you thanks, too. Tina. Thank you. Uh, good night. Um, we have an off-the-air question there, Ross. Please repeat the website where you can get Ross's book. And is there a place other than the Internet to get it? Okay, it's at uh, www.utahadvance.org. Utah, A-D-V-A-N-C-E, just the one word, utahadvance.org. You can see it on the screen. And is there another place than the Internet to get it? Yeah, if you're, if you're around Weber County or Roy, you could stop by at Wasatch Church and pick up a copy for it. It's not in bookstores at this point in time. I'm self-publishing it and just trying to get it around through churches and ministries. More and more of the churches in town are becoming aware of it. Um, so it just came out, it just uh, came out a month or so ago. Mm -hmm. And I also want to mention too, for anyone who's interested, that, that if I get enough people who want to do, I will host a group to go through mm -hmm. this book. It's a very, very good book. I can't, I can't speak highly enough of it. It's so good for those who have transitioned out or are transitioning, or even if you're thinking about it. This is really a good resource, and I will host a group uh, for people who want to go through the book. And if you're interested, you can email tv at aboutpolygamy.com and let me know, or you can uh, call tonight and leave your contact information, and uh, I'll give you a call back. Okay, we have line one, Clint from Provo. Hello, Clint. Yes. Yes, you're on the air. Hello. Hello, what's your Hi, question? Clint. Yeah, um, I just had a question. Um, I wanted you to comment, either of you, on um, a couple of biblical scriptures, one in Amos 3.7 and one in Jeremiah 1.5, if you could. And the next part is, is I just wanted to ask you <clears throat> if, for the most part, you guys believe that uh, mainstream Mormon Mormonism is, uh, brings forth good fruits. 
Um, where do you want to start? Amos 37 is, uh, I don't, uh, Doris is looking those up I, right now. I think Amos 37 is, um, unless two, how can two walk together unless they are agreed? Or is, is it, that about, or is it the God won't reveal anything unless he does it through the prophets? Yeah, it's the same context. Okay, yeah. so go for um, it. Yeah, well, um, I, t I look at that in the context of Hebrews chapter 1, where, where, which talks about how in the past times God, spoke through various pro prophets in various ways and diverse manners, but in these latter days he's spoken through his son. And so Hebrews chapter 1 puts it into context by describing two different eras of revelation. It, it sp speaks clearly of the past and then the era that we're in now. So in past times, uh, Amos 3 represents the way that God communicated in past times, but now the, the, the revelation of the son uh, supersedes that as, as revealed, as um, he revealed himself through his son, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And, and, and the explication of that is in the New Testament. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know why I want to go back to a former era of revelation when we exist in the era of fulfillment um, today. Now that's, that's Amos. We could obviously, you, you gave us an awful lot, Clint, at once, because <laughs> that's a whole interesting subject and so is uh, Jeremiah 1, which I think is the, the pre-existence. Pre it, it's, uh, I formed you in the valley before, before I knew you. About how but we're back, to Jeremiah or... back in the Amos 1, however, the context is judgment on Israel. Mm -hmm. That's the context. Right, and, and you can't pull something out of context and apply a whole new doctrine to it. It doesn't work. Uh, well, you can because people do it all the time and, fa and form false religions, but it doesn't work uh, in God's economy. And the context of, Jer of um, Amos 3 is not uh, anything but judgment on Israel for disobedience. And the one in Jeremiah is the, the, would be the preexistence. Mm -hmm. I formed you in the belly. And that's just because he knew Jeremiah. He didn't right. God, that he was going to create God in his infinite knowledge knows, knows everything in advance as if it's in the present tense. Um, so what it, what it, the question is, what does he mean when he says, I knew you, you know, before you were formed in the womb? In what sense did God know him? Individually, personally, did God know him, at, you know, because, uh, on, the, on the basis of his um, infinite foreknowledge? It's certainly, the, I think the preexistence is possible based on uh, Jeremiah 1.5, but it's certainly not required mm -mm. based on Jeremiah 1.5, and then the rest mm -hmm. of Scripture doesn't really it doesn't give us anything to, to hang that on either. Right, and Jeremiah, or um, Zechariah 12, he, he formed the spirit within man, not in heaven in a preexistence, but within mm -hmm. A thin man in Jeremiah or um, Zechariah 12. So I hope that. Helps yeah, and, with and as far as fruit, yeah, I see good fruit in Mormonism. I see good fruit in every moral religious system. Um, so I'm not sure what that proves. But yeah, it's not salvation. You don't get salvation by doing good works. The Bible is totally against it. I see. Thanks for taking my call. You guys have a good one. You're yeah, welcome. thanks, Clint. Thanks, Clint. Good night. Okay, Mike in Ogden on line two. Hello, Mike. Well, actually, Doris, um, <laughs> I've been waiting, but the person, I was going to say Jeremiah, but the person beat me to the punch about the pre-existence. That's one thing where you get it from. And I am agree with you guests there. Um, you know, it's, it really has nothing to do with salvation, and, uh, um, and it, it's possible, you know, but it, it's really not that important. And But there is a difference in the Bible and the Hebrew between spirit and soul. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you were talking about Zechariah. Mm -hmm. There are two different differences. But uh, what I was going to say is also mainly he got it from masonry, the pre-existence. That's where he did, you know, the, the temple endowment ceremony. Uh, yeah. A few weeks after he became a master mason, you probably know this, Joseph um, instituted the temple endowment ceremonies. And they're almost directly, I mean, they're so, they're almost, even the temple over in Salt Lake, um, if you just look at it, it's got so many Masonic symbols on this, it, it's just, Unreal, but as far as the pre-existence and whatnot, yeah, he definitely um, that's out of masonry. Now I can just say that because I, I have someone in the family that was a mason, so I, I know. Okay, uh, I, I didn't know that pre-existence came from masonry. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know, know that. Uh, Doris, I, I guess but. I'll let you go so I can listen to myself. Okay, <laughs> and, and thanks All for right. hey, keep up the good work, guys. Thanks for All your right. call. But, uh, yes. Again, it's not important, you know. Yeah, uh, well. Salvation, is uh, essential, but the pre-existence is not. Well, no, except for one thing about the pre-existence is if, um, and I think he hung up, 
um, is that Mormonism stands or falls on the pre-existence doctrine. Yeah. You can, mm -hmm. every, almost every single doctrine they've got falls if the pre-existence falls. So they have to hang on to that to keep their doctrines right. going. Right, it, 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 all, it all coheres. If, it, if they were to remove that, it wouldn't make sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it would all go away. Okay, line three, <clears throat> Dennis and Sandy. Hello, uh, Dennis. Hello there. Yes, hey, you're on Dennis. the air. Um, I just wanted to call and uh, let you know that uh, Joseph got the pre-existence idea from a book titled The Philosophy of a Future State by Thomas Dick. And that can be found in Grant Palmer's book, mm -hmm. An Insider's View of Mormon Origins. Okay. So, And that's where he came up with that. But it is it is a a an Eastern mysticism idea. But uh, the previous caller said it came out of Freemasonry, and I've studied Freemasonry for years, and I've never found the preexistence in Freemasonry. And so, from your call and the caller before, it teaches us once again that we need to study mm -hmm. and find out these things for ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, Dennis. Yes, that's right. So that's I just wanted to forward that information on to your first caller that was asking about the pre-existence. Well, we thank you so much All for right. your call. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night. Bye. Bye. Okay, well, we have some interesting calls taking mm. place there. Um, the relationships, uh, we were still on that. Mm. Um, I want to quickly, and I'm glad that we still have time to do this, because, I, Ross, I really would like you, in your book, you mention, uh, on page 22, number 5, you mention giving and receiving grace. And what I would like you to do is, our viewers, if you would discuss the meaning of biblical grace, because mm -hmm. I don't think that people from a Mormon-based religion understand biblical grace. Yeah. What does it mean to give and receive grace? Mm -hmm. I see people, this is one of the hardest issues in the transition that people make, is really understanding grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is receiving a gift that I didn't deserve or didn't have to earn. Grace is Christmas. Um, you know, we talk about, uh, sometimes analogies are given for salvation that, it, you know, if you bought a bicycle, that, you know, if, the, if only the child paid a dollar and the dad paid a hundred dollars, you know, that's grace. Well, I think grace is more than that. I, don't, I never ask my kids to pay a dollar for a Christmas present. Yeah. You know, I never ask them to, you know, be good. Santa Claus isn't grace because right. he, he's watching whether you're good or not. Yeah, he keeps you know? the list. He's keeping his list, <laughs> checking it twice. You know, grace is unmerited gift. It's mm -hmm. an unmerited gift that's given. And so that applies in salvation because that's how we are right before God. And it applies in relationships in the local church. Uh, Jesus told a story about someone who has forgiven a great deal then who should turn around and forgive someone who had wronged him. So we apply grace in relationships in the local church by treating people with that same kind of favor, mm -hmm. by not expecting them to have to live up to all of our expectations, um, and not by, ju by not judging them right. if they don't measure up to our standards Absolutely. or if we don't feel like that. And so what happens when we treat people with grace is that... Um, they can then open up and be vulnerable and share their real life and their real hurts and their real needs, and we can actually enter into um, helping and encouraging each other. And you also mentioned, I think it's in the next chapter, but I, I really want to mention this too because mm -hmm. it's so good. You said grace is not opposed to effort. Mm -hmm. It's only opposed to earning. earning. And right. that, what you just said, but we're often accused of being opposed to good works simply mm -hmm. because we say we're saved by, the Bible says we're saved, saved by, by grace. grace, but we're not opposed to good works. We're saved to do good works. Exactly. We're supposed to do good works exactly. and we're not opposed to it, but grace is. Right. And so the, the mistake there would be to think that grace means that we just can go out and live however we want yeah. and it doesn't change our lives. Yeah. Um, grace changes our lives. You bet. And so we still, we still enter into disciplines of Bible study and prayer and fasting and so forth, but not to earn God's favor, but as an expression of our gratitude and our relationship with Him, our desire to know Him. Mm -hmm. And our change of want to's. We, exactly. We want to. Uh, do these things, whereas before we probably did Exactly, want to. <laughs> that's a great point. Or we wanted to and couldn't because we didn't have the power. Yeah. Okay, Amanda in Kaysville is calling, line one. Hello, Amanda. I guess I just had a question. I'm wondering if... Hello? 
Uh, yes, I just had a question. I'm wondering if you can explain the difference between the Mormon Trinity and the Christian Trinity, the Godhead, I guess. Uh, yeah, in a, in a nutshell, the, the Mormon concept of the Godhead is that there's three different beings, each one of whom exists independently of each other, and each one of whom is, is divine. Uh, the, the biblical concept of the Trinity, even though that word is never used, the Trinity is a shorthand for this biblical view that takes into account two ideas that the Bible teaches. One is that there's only one God, period. There's only one God. But at the same time, the Father is presented as God, the Son is presented as God, the Holy Spirit is presented as God. And so to be true to everything the Bible teaches, then I, <clears throat> then I believe that there's one, there's one God who eternally exists in three persons. Now, I can't explain how it works because God is infinite, but I can explain that, that, that the basic teaching, uh, the LDS teaching three different gods, that they work together in unity, but they're not one being. The biblical teaching, there's only one God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a friend, and I know that the Bible says the Holy Spirit's God, Jesus is God, the Father is God, and there's only uh, one God. So that right there establishes the Trinity. A friend of mine said, if, sometimes you can say, if you've got the triple combination, you've got one book, but there's three books in one. Mm -hmm. And he said he explained that to a Mormon one time, and they got it just like that. <laughs> so maybe that will help okay. you, too. That is a good way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, good night. Okay, Ross, it looks like we're at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. We didn't get through, but we did get some good, good points. Yeah. And I want to thank, thank you so you. much for coming and for writing the book. And, thank you. And uh, I hope that we have some viewers who would like to do a group on this, and I'd certainly be happy to host it. Uh, two weeks ago, a caller called... And he gave us really quite an argument about Mark chapter 16, where he insisted that it teaches that baptism is necessary for salvation. And in closing, I want to revisit that uh, about what our caller was so concerned about. He scoffed at God's promise of salvation by grace, yet we read in places like Luke chapter 7, verse 50 and 18, 42, where Jesus said, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Well, our caller reasoned that anyone can just say they believe in Jesus and then go out and start killing people. But as one as someone so wisely pointed out to me after the show that night, he said, well, couldn't someone just as easily get baptized and go out and start killing people? And of course, that is true. Water does not change anyone's heart. Um, it wasn't easy for our Savior to save us on the cross, and that's one thing that we need to keep in mind. He paid our price for salvation, and He made it as simple as possible for everyone to be saved so that on Judgment Day no one can say they didn't have an excuse. When we bow to God by faith in true repentance and we ask Jesus Christ to be our Savior because we believe and trust in Him uh, to have paid our price on the cross for our sins, God then gives us a new heart and people with a new heart will not go out and start killing people. And if you don't have a new heart, you're not saved. That's the Christian gospel. Those with a new heart will do different works. Instead, they make every effort to go out and tell other people they too can be saved by grace after all that Jesus has done for them, period. I want to thank you for watching the show and we'll see you next week.